One of the biggest obstacles to becoming a successful corporate explorer is the inside out mindset of corporations. This is the self referring logic of being a part of a large, successful organization that views customers and competitors through the lens of your existing business. This mindset is highly destructive to any new venture because it leaves corporate explorers with unchallenged biases and assumptions about their customers, what they need what they value, what solutions they prefer, and their willingness to pay for them. Customer discovery interviews are a way of overcoming the biases of inside out by getting you outside of the building and talking directly to potential customers. That's an excerpt from a chapter of the Corporate Explorer Fieldbook called Get Out of the Building, How to Gather Customer Driven Data. And before I introduce our guest today and co-author of that chapter. My thanks to our sponsor of the Corporate Explorer series, Wazoku. Wazoku helps large organizations create effective, sustainable innovation ecosystems that accelerate efficiency gains and new value growth. It does this through intelligent enterprise software that connects and harnesses the value of employees, startups, universities, and the unique Wazoku crowd of over 700,000 global problem solvers. Wazoku calls this connected collective intelligence, and you can find Wazoku at www.wazoku.com. Now to our guest. She is an innovation strategy and management consultant, expert researcher and policy advisor on responsible tech. And she is also global innovation lead at Oxfam America and part of Change Logic's extended team. She was formerly a professor at McGill University. And she is with us today to talk about this chapter. Vanessa Saya, you are very welcome to the show. Thanks, Aiden. It's great to be here. It's great to have you because you bring us some extreme wisdom today. Because most people would treat data driven interviews all the same, but it all depends on what phase you're in. It all depends on the mindset of the organization. It depends on your innovation maturity. And I have a little bit to tee us up here. Before I hand over the reins to you, Vanessa, you say that interviews and focus groups are two of the most common qualitative research methods employed to generate deep insights about customers. Focus groups can be a time saving way to measure customer reactions to your product or idea, but it can be difficult to avoid groupthink and get honest answers from each participant. In this chapter, you outline the when and how of interviewing customers and followers of this series will understand that there are three major stages of the innovation process, ideation, incubation, and scaling, and how we approach the interview process and design our interviews depends on our innovation maturity, our research goals, and where we are on that pipeline. Vanessa, over to you to bring us through this fascinating chapter. Thanks, Aiden. As you mentioned, there are these three overarching phases within the innovation funnel, ideation, incubation, and scaling. At each phase, you have different goals. When you're ideating, you're doing more exploratory work. You want to define a problem. Maybe you have some initial assumptions and hypotheses to test and validate. So the types of questions that you ask, the purpose of your interviews, and even your interviewees will differ from the incubation phase where you have an initial concept perhaps a more developed MVP, and you're focused more on iteration. So questions will be more targeted towards validating this solution market fit, for instance. With scaling, again, it's a different stage, different goals. As you move through the funnel, your primary research goals, the target research participants or customers, your interviewees, the topics that you'll focus on, and of course, the target outcome, so your ideal outcomes of the interview, will differ. If we take a look at the ideation stage, so again, defining a customer problem, that tends to be your goal. You have, you want to formulate an initial hypothesis or test an initial hypothesis. You're also trying to get acquainted with a target customer audience, right? So you may have a, a general idea or a general assumption about what the problem is and, and who your target you know, customer is, but but it's important to, to really understand the customer, immerse yourself in the point of view of the customer at this stage. This is a stage where you discard problems that don't really exist. Ensure that 
problem that you want to focus your innovation efforts on is a problem that customers believe that they have, want to have solved, and eventually will want to, to pay to have it solved. In this stage, if we think about the various types of customers, the people that you might want to interview, you'll be looking at decision makers, users, field experts, and people you believe to be your target population segment. And thinking about, is the problem that you've identified real? What are the consequences of not solving this particular problem? Are they satisfied with the alternatives that exist in the market or not? Why? Why not? Again, you're validating your problem, but you're also looking for opportunities to maybe unearth bigger problems that customers want to solve for first. So even if you validate a particular problem, if it turns out that there's another one that's more urgent, perhaps you should be refocusing or pivoting your attention to, toward that one. In terms of outcomes, you want to leave this stage in, in a place where you can move into the ideation stage or hold some ideation sessions with the question, how might we solve this particular problem? And that problem has been validated. Once you move to the incubation stage, again, you're looking more at validating the solution market fit and even the, the problem market fit. So you're thinking about improving customer segmentation, in sharpening your customer profiles. You want to ensure that your early prototype meets people's requirements. Right? And, and so through this process, you're looking to collect feedback that you can use to iterate and improve on your particular solution. And so when thinking about interviews, we might think of more open and more targeted interviews. You're trying to learn and you don't want to be restraining the customer, your interviewee too much with highly targeted questions. But when you have an MVP, so you've done a lot of exploratory work, you've validated a lot of your problem and so forth, even perhaps your early concepts. Now you have an MVP, a minimal viable product or offering. And so it's more targeted. You want to understand what do people like about it? What works? What doesn't work? And you want to make sure that this prototype meets user requirements and that you collect that feedback to be able to iterate, improve, refine throughout this incubation process. So in terms of interviewees, at this stage, you have a much clearer idea of your customer segment. If you think about the customer decision tree, you will have target users, influencers and recommenders, people who test the real decision makers in a household, for instance. So even if your target user is a child, who is really the buyer? Maybe it's the parents and they're really the decision makers there. And you also have saboteurs, those who oppose, who will say, ah, I don't want to use this. I don't like it. I don't think it's a great idea. And so at this stage, you want to interview as many people across this customer decision tree as possible to understand the different perspectives. One of the mistakes, and this goes a little bit into the do's and don'ts, a, a mistake that, that people tend to make at this stage is they'll only interview target users. So they just want to learn what the target user likes, doesn't like, what works, doesn't work, et cetera, and get feedback from them. But the target user isn't necessarily, as I was saying, the person buying that product or the decision maker. So even if the target user loves it, if the decision maker says, no way, and, or the buyer says, no, we're not buying this, it, it's unlikely to succeed in the market, right? So again, it's important to understand, to get information and feedback from across the decision tree, including the saboteurs, the opposers, because you want to understand those who don't want it, why are they opposing it? Perhaps that's something you can address and, and be able to increase your market share. Once we move into ideation, incubation, when you're interviewing at the, at, during this incubation stage, your outcomes are to refine the customer segmentation and personas. You validated the feasibility, viability, and desirability of MVP, and you've gotten some great data to help you refine and improve your product. Moving into the scaling stage, this is a critical point in the process because you may have gone to market, you're going to market, you may be thinking about going into new markets, so taking your product into new contexts, and, and you might encounter unexpected blockers, right? Some of them will be internal. So maybe there's lack of operational capacity. There might be resistance from other business units or an absence of partners to, to really sustain the scaling of this solution. At the same time, you, as you move into new markets, you might be finding new needs, new challenges as well. And, and so it's not a given that just because this works, something was successful in the U.S. can just be taken to the European market, for instance. So you need to continue validating customer traction 
And you might actually need to do some to approach the interviews by ex extracting from some of the 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 methods and targeting the, the same types of interviewees that you did early on, because there will be a, a new level of exploratory work. But again, so you're you need to interview all stakeholders from the customer decision tree. You're trying to ensure that your product or service has customer traction and will have that traction in a new market as you scale. You'll be thinking about your external partners. So again, for the sustainability, who will you work with if you are working with external partners? Will they be able to support this, the scaling of this solution or this offering? And then you're also interviewing key stakeholders within your own organization, including department heads, operational colleagues. Will they support this? Will they block it? <laughs> really, what you're trying to answer here is, can and should we pursue this? Is the organization willing and capable of supporting this without negatively impacting the customer experience? Is the business model as scalable as we had expected? Do we need to modify anything for a new market? And so forth. In terms of target outcomes for the interviews that you're conducting at this phase of the funnel during the scaling stage, you're really looking for evidence of scalability, right? That your customer base has grown as expected. Proof that your internal processes are working and can grow. And that if there are any internal blockers or saboteurs in the business implementation, those can be addressed. And of course, you want to establish a strong customer feedback loop so that you can continue to improve your offering. Some of the things that come to mind are firstly, right, I'm the corporate explorer. Say it's you with inside your organization. You will have a strong confirmation bias. If you like the idea, if you believe in the idea, you will go to people who are going to confirm that it's a great idea, or you'll go to people who are friendly, or you'll ask the question in a biased way. And I'm going to share as well for those looking at us on YouTube, I'll share the link to an episode we did before called the mom test, where you try to avoid this, but it doesn't talk about you within the organization. And one of the reasons is, as you well know, we get so much criticism as the corporate explorer. We meet so many roadblocks. You talk about saboteurs and the title of your chapter is get outside the building. But most of the saboteurs actually come from within inside the building <laughs> when you're trying to drive change, particularly if it's going to potentially cannibalize the business model in any way. And I'd love if you had any insights for us on that stuff that you have experienced or how also we as the corporate explorer can avoid that trap of only going after people who are going to go, yeah, it's a great idea, go for it. And then we do all the work and we get to the end, to the scaling point, and we fail terribly. When you include key stakeholders in the co-creation process, you actually mitigate your risk of failure on multiple levels. And this is an, another way that you can be outside in. So, you know, I can sit in my office and have a great idea and create a solution without checking in with my target customers. Well, that's quite risky, right? Because we have bias and we should be valid, validating with our target customers. Well, actually, I would extend that to key stakeholders within and outside of the organization. So just as you would validate with key figures or personas across that customer decision tree, I think internally you want to do something similar because when these key stakeholders are a part of the design and rollout process, you are getting their input along the way. And so you're able to identify blockers before you reach the finish line. And then someone from another division tells you this isn't possible for these reasons. Whereas if they were included throughout the process, you're able to unearth some of these issues earlier on, right? I would recommend doing the same thing with key stakeholders within your organization who will play a pivotal role in scaling your solution should it work. That's absolutely gold, that advice. Nessa, I, I work with companies as well. And if the company is highly regulated or work in an industry that's highly regulated, I say you got to have the risk team in the room. You got to have the regulation team in the room. A startup, for example, if you're a fintech, your temptation for your first hire is maybe a CTO, but your t first hire should probably be a head of compliance or somebody that can tell you where you can't play from the get go to your very point. Later on in the chapter, you say the inter interview process has three key phases, preparation, conducting interviews themselves, and then summarizing and anal analyzing collected data and What's really important, and again, we just dive into this. Each stage 
has specific do's and don'ts, and these are vital to understand. I'd love you to share them with our audience. Absolutely. So when you're in the, the stage of preparing for your interviews, right, that's actually the number one rule is be prepared. So you want to prepare an interview guide, which includes your questions, and you have a clear sense of who you're meeting and why, and you plan a guide for each persona, right? So one of the biggest do's, I would say, at this stage is interviewing several people from your customer segment. I mentioned this earlier. If you only speak to the target users, they show a lot of interest in your solution, but then the decision makers or buyers do not. There's an issue there. So you want to interview several people from across this customer decision tree from your cus uh, target customer segment. You also want to be creative about where you interview people. Where do people hang out? Where are they going? Where are they spending their time? Go there, find them, use social media, use your contacts, right? In terms of conducting the interviews, so there's been research on how many, re how many interviews are enough. So, you know, you have, you've prepared your guide, you have your list of interview questions and a list of interviewees. And now, and now you're wondering, okay, so how many people do I need to interview really? So there's research that's come out of Carnegie Mellon with uh, Professor Granger Morgan. He and his co-authors conducted a study and found that no new concepts will emerge after 20 in-depth interviews. In fact, they found that most new data emerges in the first five or six interviews. Similarly, you have other researchers like Greg Guest and his colleagues who found that after conducting 60, 60, in-depth interviews, 70% of the themes identified in their research emerged in the first six interviews. By the 12th interview, they had 97% of the key themes. So if your time is limited, five or six interviews will help you identify the biggest boulders, right? The prominent key themes within your target segment. As a rule of thumb, I tend to recommend between five and 12 per segment, with eight being, in my experience, what you might call a saturation sweet spot. So this moment of saturation is when data starts to repeat itself. With every new interview, you're getting less and less new, new data. So in terms of do's and don'ts, you want to conduct at least five interviews per segment, right? You want to follow your interview guide, your list of questions. You want to create a relaxed tone. Be open and surprised to insights. So try not to restrain your interviewees too much. It's also a great practice to have at least one colleague review your interview guide. In the actual interview setting, it's always great to have one moderator who can focus on conducting the interview and one note taker who can focus on capturing the data. In terms of don'ts, again, kind of on the flip side, you don't want to be unprepared. It's really pointless to continue interviewing after saturation. It's a waste of time and resources, so you might want to avoid that. If, I would also recommend not stopping your interviews until you validate or invalidate your hypothesis. So if you haven't found a way to validate your hypothesis or not, perhaps you need to make adjustments to the types of questions, revisit your interview guide. And, and I guess another thing to be mindful of is you don't want to assume that you know your customer problems and immediately jump to questions about a solution. Try to, to be sure you define and understand the problem first. And I guess one other big one is try to avoid yes and no, yes and no answers, questions that will yield yes and no answers because you're trying to get rich insights, right? So just a yes or no, maybe ask them why, you know, try to understand if, if a yes or no does come up, then, you know, try and dig deeper. At the stage when you're summarizing and analyzing data, this is also a moment when a lot of bias can be introduced. At this stage, what you want to do is summarize and make note of your key observations and insights as soon as possible after conducting the interview while ideas and impressions are, are fresh. Some people use spreadsheets. Some people like to put it on a whiteboard, use stickies. It, it, it doesn't really matter uh, how you do it, but it's important to create thematic clusters based on the data. It's also an excellent practice at this stage to have other participants and members of your team to validate the data and to maybe even do their own clustering exercises. Because whenever we cluster, we're interpreting that data. So the more people that you have interpreting the data, the more perspectives you'll get. And it's a way, again, to, to minimize bias. Check your own interpretations for bias, including confirmation bias. Last question for you, Vanessa is where can people find you? Where's the best place to reach out if they have questions? What's the best place? People can reach me through LinkedIn. Be happy to answer any questions. 
Before I thank and sign off with our guest today, I want to thank our sponsor, Wazoku, sponsor of the Corporate Explorer series. Wazoku helps large organizations create effective, sustainable innovation ecosystems that accelerate efficiency gains and new value growth. It does this through intelligent enterprise software that connects and harnesses the power of employees, suppliers, startups, universities, and the unique Wazoku crowd of over 700,000 global problem solvers. Wazoku calls this connected collective intelligence, and you can find out more at www.wazoku.com. Finally, thank you to the co-author of the Corporate Explorer Fieldbook, and in particular that chapter we covered Get Out of the Building, Vanessa Saya. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Aidan.